Good morning, everyone. Um, as Daniel mentioned earlier, my name's Caleb. My wife, Beck, and I have been uh, members at Kindred for about the last two years. Uh, we had our first daughter, Micah Rose, um, in November, which has been super exciting. You might know her as the baby in the back right corner of the room that has uh, often has a lot to say. Um, a comment during the sermon, wail of lament during the prayer. She's spending her first day in nursery this time, so if you want to set up a quick prayer for that, uh, it would be much appreciated. Before we continue, would you please pray with me? Dear Lord God, uh, we thank you this morning for gathering your church here, uh, for the wonderful worship led by Candice and the band, and for the chance to hear how your spirit might speak into our lives this week. In the coming moments, I ask that if anything that I say by your spirit is useful, life-giving, and true, I pray they would find root in the hearts of your people and that you would keep it in the forefront of their minds as they leave this place. But God, if anything that I say misses the mark, or if anything is not true to you or to your character, I ask just cover everybody's ears and allow it to fall harmlessly to the floor. We ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Daniel also mentioned that I'm a doctoral student at Duke Divinity School, uh, so I'm really excited to have a chance to talk with you all about this really interesting and strange story from Isaiah 6 that PJ read for us just a few moments ago. Uh, this is the uh, Old Testament passage assigned to this Sunday in the Revised Common Lectionary. And as I began digging into this, this strange story, I realized that there are sort of like two basic types of sermons that we could go with this morning. There's a, a fun, inspiring sermon on the one hand, and then there's sort of like an intense and challenging sermon on the other. And to show you what I mean, I want to just kind of briefly walk through this passage together, beginning to end, just to get the basic scene out in front of us. If you want to follow along on your phone, on the bulletin, Bible app, um, anything like that, never a bad idea. We're in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, which begins, In the year that King Uzziah died. We're going to pause right there, because right away, the biblical author has located us at a very specific moment in the life and history of the kingdom of Israel and Judah. According to the biblical story, at its height, the nation of Israel, it was, it was the jewel of the ancient Near East. The wise kings David and Solomon presided over a golden age in which Israel was a powerful, a wealthy, and a, and a largely good and just society. But this here in Isaiah 6-1, the year that King Uzziah died, is not that time. By the time that King Uzziah took the throne, his kingdom had fractured into pieces, and it was, to put it mildly, a little fish in a big pond, assuming this pond is full of ravenous sharks. Uh, the nation's institutions were weak, the country was full of infighting and conflict, and the new bully on the block, the brutal nation of Assyria, is knocking on the door. This is like, this is like Rome in the 7th century, when their once proud system of government was starting to crumble all around them. Um, or it's like America right now. Um, that was a joke. I'm just kidding, you know, hopefully. Uh, the, the future is uncertain, and the confidence of the past is gone. So in the midst of this very messy and stressful ge geopolitical situation, the prophet Isaiah, in a vision, is suddenly transported into the heavenly divine realm, where he sees the Lord seated on a majestic throne, high and lifted up. Ram Vanisa in the Hebrew, some of my favorite phrases. Uh, the Lord is surrounded by seraphim, which literally just means the fiery ones. They have six wings, and they're singing so loud that it's shaking the building. It's louder than the loudest rock concert you've ever heard. They're singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. At this point, the prophet Isaiah, he, he looks around, and he's like, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be here. Uh, he is terrified that the glory of God is going to overwhelm his poor fleshly body. Amazingly, though, after a fiery one clears away Isaiah's sins, the Lord speaks, and God asks for someone to be a messenger for God to God's people. And Isaiah somehow summons up the courage to say, I mean, I'm, I'm here. Here I am. Send me. And this is where the lectionary reading ends. And if we were going to do that fun, inspiring sermon that I mentioned earlier, this is where we would stop reading as well. Uh, this is the sermon that you hear at every divinity school and seminary graduation, and don't get me wrong, it's an excellent sermon. I'm probably going to preach this sermon myself one day. You are like Isaiah, and despite your shortcomings, God is asking you to be God's messenger to the world. How are you going to respond? And ideally, we would all respond, here I am, send me. 
But this actually isn't the end of the story. If we keep reading, we hear the content of the message that Isaiah is called to bring to the people, and things just get a lot more complicated. God makes it clear to Isaiah that his message is not going to result in revival. The people of Israel are not going to turn back to God and rebuild their society on the just principles that it was founded upon. Instead, they're going to double down. They're going to dig in. Their ears and their eyes will be closed to Isaiah's pleading. And as a result, God is going to let the nation be conquered by its enemies. And its people are going to be taken away into exile. Until Isaiah 6, 11 says, Cities lie waste without inhabitants and houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate. Until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. What would a sermon that included this portion of the story look like? Um, it would be more intense. It would be more, more challenging. We would have to consider some really difficult topics, like how God feels about and responds to injustice and sin in societies in the world. We'd have to look at some of the more uncomfortable phrases that you will occasionally find in your Bible. Phrases like the anger of God or the judgment of God, stuff that doesn't make it onto those pretty journal covers of Books A Million. And at this point, you can probably already tell that this is the intense and challenging sermon. And you might understandably be wondering, um, do we have to do this one? We, you just said that there was a lighter and more fun option. Why would we go in this scary, intense direction? I'm so glad you asked. There are two reasons why. First, as a sort of, as a sort of advocate for the Bible and the Old Testament in particular, there is a, there's a phenomenon that I've run across several times. People will hear a section of scripture in, in church or something, and it sounds really nice and inspiring. So they go home to read it again or to see if there's more, and they realize, wait a second, there's a whole second section to this story that we didn't read. And this second section is really strange and confusing and a bit disturbing, actually. So what is going on here? This happens with the New Testament as well, it does, but maybe especially with the Old Testament. So this sermon is kind of like me saying, listen, I want you to hear it from me first. Not because I've, I've got all the answers. I definitely, definitely do not. But I have become convinced that even the most challenging portions of the Bible often have really important and good things to say to us. And so I'd like the chance to confront some of them together, head on, rather than have you run into them out into the wild all by yourself. The second reason is that I actually think Kindred is a really good environment in which to consider these sort of difficult and confusing kinds of issues. If you haven't been around here long, we are a church community that welcomes questions, where doubt and uncertainty is not something to be denied or to be ignored, but can be considered out in the open. And so when we get to really challenging concepts or portions of the Bible, we don't have to be scared that we're going to say something wrong or that our concerns or questions are going to be shut down. Instead, we can approach them in a, in a spirit of open curiosity with the confidence that our faith community is going to be here to help us make sense of them. And, and this is a really crucial part, to love us completely and unconditionally, even if they never do make sense to us. Um, I can't promise that the rest of this sermon is going to be simple. Uh, the world is a confusing and messy place. I, I personally think it's appropriate that the Bible, portions of at least, is similarly complex. So, you know, throw back the last bit of coffee that you came in here with. Give yourself a bit of like a, a wake-up call, whatever you got to do. I did want to provide some uh, sort of guiding lights. I've decided to call them cornerstone concepts to help us keep our footing. If I ever lose track of you along the way, look for one of these cornerstone concepts and we'll get, we'll get right back on track. There are three of them. Here we go. First, God cares enough to be angry. Second, God is powerful enough to bring about justice. And third, God loves enough to bring healing. Let's jump into it. If you read widely enough in your Bible, in either the New or the Old Testaments, you are going to come across an uncomfortable, an uncomfortable theme. It is not the dominant theme in the Bible by any means, but, but it's there. And it's not, it's not all that uncommon. The Bible sometimes describes God as being angry, really angry even. If you read around more in Isaiah, you'll find that the prophet often proclaims that the coming destruction of the city and the exile of the people is at least in part a result of God's anger. You read the Bible long enough, and you might run into a really, really scary phrase, the wrath of God. Um, 
I've been using an audio Bible app recently to help me study for a test that I have coming up at the end of the summer. And the guy that reads on this app, he uh, has a very strong and a very posh British accent. And so when I get to certain portions of the Bible, I start to hear about, I start to hear about the wrath of God. The wrath. The wrath of God. Was that good, Becca? It wasn't good? She's been helping me practice all week long. Um, it's a very weird existence to be married to a biblical scholar, by the way. Uh, wannabe biblical scholar. Anyway, for me, it's like just overly formal enough and silly to kind of take the edge off the phrase a little bit. I don't know if that's helpful for you. It's probably not. Because phrases like the anger or wrath of God have a, have a really bad and destructive history. They're often used in the church to scare people, to shame people, or to manipulate people into thinking or doing one thing or the other. So I want to acknowledge that on the forefront, and, I'm, and I want to take it very, very seriously. I also want to try to adjust our thinking just a little bit of this topic. Uh, the emotions that we feel, I think, are related to but are not the same as the emotions that God feels. Here's what I mean. I, I love my wife. I love Becca. This emotion involves a lot of things, right? A strong feeling of affection, a willingness to support and be faithful to her, a willingness to hunt down cockroaches to the very ends of the earth. Uh, I, I love my wife. I do. Um, but I don't love her. I don't love Becca perfectly. My emotions, my feeling of love for Becca is tied up in it. It's inflected by my impatience, my jealousy, um, my occasional be begrudging respect for a particularly scrappy bug. And, and God also loves Becca, but, but God loves perfectly. God's love includes all of the good parts about my love, but none of the imperfections, none of the deficiencies that twist and warp my love. My love and God's own love are related, but they're not the same. My love is an imperfect reflection of the love of God. The other week, I was watching a documentary called Alex Jones vs. the Truth. And this documentary was about the tragedy that took place at Sandy Hook Elementary School in 2012. Now, don't worry, I am not going to recount any of the terrible details of that event to you. I don't think that I need to. Just the phrase, Sandy Hook, immediately brings to our minds some of the most tragic and heartrending evil and suffering in this world. And this documentary was not just about the tragedy. It was about a certain radio host, Alex Jones, who had spread malicious and intentional lies about what had happened at the school and about the parents of the kids, proclaiming to his audience of hundreds and hundreds of thousands that it never happened and that the grieving parents were all paid actors. And as a result of this, these poor parents who are trying to recover from the worst day of their lives are being, are being hounded online, out in public, on the street, by people yelling at them that their children never existed and that they were undercover government operatives. Also, Jalex Jones could, could boost his viewership and sell bogus health supplements. Inevitably, the documentary also touched on our own American culture's inability or just unwillingness to deal with the issue of gun violence in any sort of significant and impactful way. And so I was watching this documentary, and my own little baby, she's just a few months old at the time, she's on the floor over here to my left. Um, I mean, she was on a play mat or something. She wasn't, like, on the floor on the floor. Um, but she's over here making funny sounds, and I'm watching these poor parents, and I'm hearing about the NRA's underhanded lobbying efforts to thwart any legislation designed to stop this sort of tragedy from happening again. And I have this big mason jar of water in my hand. And I am almost overwhelmed by an impulse to just, to just hurl this mason jar at my TV. I didn't. I didn't. But I wanted to for a second. I, I was furious. I had little angry tears in the side of my eyes and everything. And I, I think that there are aspects of that intense emotion, that anger that I was feeling, that are, that are good. It is right, in some sense, to respond with anger to the terrible violence, mistreatment, and injustice perpetrated against people in the world. If people don't respond with some kind of strong emotion to this sort of thing, we're worried that they're suffering from some sort of lack of empathy. And I think that I think that whatever the wrath of God or anger of God means, it is all the good elements of this response that I had, the visceral emotional rejection of evil and injustice, the capacity to be moved by the suffering of other people, and the desire to make things right without any of the inevitable and who knows how many psychological issues wrapped up in my momentary desire to smash my television set. 
And if you read widely enough in the book of Isaiah and the other prophets, you'll learn that not only that God is sometimes angry, but why? According to the biblical record, the nations of Israel and Judah had, since their golden age, devolved into incredibly unjust, oppressive, and unfaithful societies. When the nation was founded, God told the people over and over again to care for the poor and for the vulnerable. The prophet, but, the promise, the, but the prophet Amos says that a king Uzziah's Israel, the poor are being sold into slavery for a pair of sandals, while the rich get destitute by manipulating the vulnerable. Isaiah pleads with the people to reject the religious practices of the surrounding nations like Assyria, which include things like co coerced prostitution, and according to certain verses in the Bible, even child sacrifice, but nobody would listen. And friends, if there isn't a God out there who cares enough to be angry at this kind of evil and at all the other injustices and suffering that all too often devastate God's world, if the victims of this sort of evil just dissipate into thin air, or reach a God who is completely unmoved by them. Honestly, there are very few thoughts that I personally find more depressing. And so we've arrived at our first cornerstone concept for this morning, which I humbly suggest to you is actually good news for us, is that God cares enough to be angry. Now, I mentioned that there are differences, really important differences between the emotions that we feel and the emotions that God feels. And one of the biggest differences between my anger and any anger God might have is what we do as a result of that anger, right? I wanted to smash my television set, which is the dumbest possible reaction to that sort of thing. Theoretically, I could have, like, I don't know, written my congressman or donated to some sort of fund for the victims of gun violence, something that, however small, might make some sort of actual difference. But I didn't, at the moment at least, feel the impulse to do any of those things, just to, I don't know, break our TV and make a giant mess. God's reaction is different. And to learn how, I want to do two things. First, we're going to do a, a brief little straw poll, raise our hands, that sort of thing. And then we're going to learn a Hebrew word. Does that sound exciting to you? Are you excited? You're, you're excited. I can tell. You're excited. Okay, so first, straw poll. Please raise your hand if you have positive associations with, you just generally like the word and the concept of justice. Justice. Fans of justice in the room. Okay, one, two, three, everybody. Great, great. Awesome. That's good to know. Now... I want you to raise your hand if you have positive associations, you just generally like the concept of judgment. Interesting. Okay, nobody. Very, very interesting. All right, uh, can I get the, that, that one slide? Yes. This is maybe my favorite Hebrew word of all time. Uh, this word is pronounced mishpat. Hebrew goes right to left, so we're starting over here. Mish, break in the middle, pot. Mishpat. Go ahead and say mishpat with me on three. One, two, three. Mishpat. Great. Now, mishpat means both justice and judgment. Anytime that you read in the Bible about justice, that's mishpat. Anytime you read in the Bible about judgment, that's also mishpat. There is only one word for both of these concepts. And this tells us, I think, something really profound about how the Bible thinks about these important and complicated topics. In the Bible, justice, judgment, mishpat, it involves all of the things that we like about the word justice, fairness and equality, freedom for the oppressed and the marginalized, the righting of wrongs. It also includes things that sound a bit more like judgment. Mishpat involves a strong denunciation and when necessary, a dismantling of the systems and powers that resist justice, the systems and powers that are sources of suffering, oppression, and equality. Martin Luther King famously quoted Amos chapter 5, verse 7 in his I Have a Dream speech. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Now, MLK, I don't know if you knew this, but he was a biblical scholar. And he undoubtedly knew that what he was calling for in the American civil rights movement was mishpat. In order to transform American society, especially Southern America, from a culture that was literally built upon slavery and discrimination into something that reached America's stated goals of freedom and justice for all. In order to get from point A to point B, it was going to take an active form of justice that often included things that sounded a bit more like judgment. The American Civil Rights Movement involved justice for the, freedoms, for the victims of this cruel society. It meant freeing innocent people from jail. It meant establishing and then restoring the voting rights of entire demographics. It meant the Army of the United States forcibly integrating schools like my own alma mater, Sanford University in Birmingham, Alabama, so the black children and young adults could have the same opportunities as their peers. The Civil Rights Movement also involved a, den a denunciation and a dismantling 
of oppressive structures and the people who perpetrated them. It meant prosecuting the racist and corrupt sheriffs in the South that often either looked the other way or directly participated in terrible vigilante justice, not justice, vigilante violence against innocent black men and women and against individuals who were brave enough to resist the system. It meant forcibly removing those people from power, prosecuting their crimes, and too rarely, unfortunately, putting them in jail. It meant tearing down the economic substructure of Southern life down to the studs. Because, of course, this society was built on the fundamental and horrific injustice of slavery. And to the privileged members of this society, this felt like judgment. But it was actually an imperfect and ongoing, of course, attempt to bring about mishpat. In the, ancient, in the case of ancient Isaac, uh, of Israel, the year that King Uzziah died, God, as a result of God's outrage at sin and justice and cruelty, vows to bring about mishpat, justice slash judgment, in a manner that I think is somewhat similar to this example from America's own history. This meant the dismantling of a cruel and unjust society. It meant the exile of the people from their homeland so that the damage caused by the society could be stopped and the possibility, the promise of something new and right and good might begin to emerge. Because when God is angry at sin, injustice, and cruelty, God just doesn't just start smashing random things. Again, I didn't actually do that. I just very momentarily wanted to. God, thankfully, has the wisdom and the power to effect real change to bring about Mishpat. And so we've arrived at our second cornerstone concept for this morning. And friends, honestly, I'm not sure this one is like uncomplicated good news, at least, at least for me. I'm an economically secure white man living in the most prosperous country in the history of the world. I'm not always 100% sure which side of Mishpat I fall on, so to speak. But I confess by faith, if nothing else, that it is good news that there's a God that works to save and elevate the humble and the oppressed and to bring down the proud and the oppressive. It's good news that God is powerful enough to bring about Mishpat. Daniel mentioned at the beginning of our service this morning that today is, is Trinity Sunday, the day in the church calendar where we celebrate and traditionally uh, we attempt to wrap our poor mortal brains around the Christian concept of the Trinity. Honestly, it might just be like a bad idea to try to tackle this concept in the last six to seven minutes of a sermon in which I already asked you to stick with me through such light and fun topics like the, the wrath and the judgment of God. But I'm going to try it anyway because um, I told Daniel I would. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Anything I do up here is completely of my own volition, however misguided it may be. Um, the early Christian church developed the doctrine of the Trinity based on their reading of Scripture and their experience of God in the life of the believers. And the most fundamental uh, assertion of this doctrine is this. There is and there always has been one God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the Christian God, there is a oneness about the Christian God, but there is also a threeness. And Christian philosophers and, theolo- and theologians have been trying to figure out what in the world that means for the last 2,000 years. Although Daniel gave one of the best explanations I've heard in the first like 30 seconds of this worship service. So um, you can go ask him. Anyway, we're not going to solve the logic puzzle this morning. So instead, I want to focus on a single element of what is called Trinitarian theology that I think will help us wrap up some of the things that we're discussing this morning. In Trinitarian theology, part of what makes God one is that there is a single will between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The members of the Trinity, they never disagree. It never happens where, like, like the Father wants to get BB's chicken after church, but the Son is feeling like Mexican, and the Holy Spirit is, like, already hangry and can't, can't make up its mind. That never happens. Never happens. When what one member of the Trinity feels, thinks, and desires, each member of the Trinity feels, thinks, and desires. Friends, you might occasionally hear about the angry God of the Old Testament in contrast to the loving and compassionate Jesus Christ from the new. And there are a number of reasons why I would want to gently and compassionately push back on this. But one of them is that it is, to put it really dramatically, bad Trinitarian theology. It, it, it assumes a disagreement, a plurality of wills among members of the Trinity. On the one hand, it assumes that Jesus is never moved and upset by injustice and cruelty in the world. He is. According to the Christian tradition, God has always been triune, so we need to imagine Jesus also in the heavenly courtroom being serenaded by the fiery ones. Uh, And one of the first things that Jesus did when he came down to earth in the Gospel of John was to flip over the tables of the money changers and the salesmen in the temple who who were praying on the poverty and vulnerability of the worshipers. But, but even more tragically, this misconception implies that when the Bible is talking about the love of God, which is, by the way, the dominant theme of the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, it implies that we're not talking 
about the Father. And this, I'm afraid, is a really, really big problem. The most important event, events in the Christian life, in the Christian faith, in the Christian story are the cross and the resurrection. They are the unexpected plot twist. And what is so paradoxical and amazing about these events is that when it came time for God, the triune God's ultimate blow against sin, injustice, cruelty, and death, when it was time for God's definitive action to bring about Mishpat, it looked strangely like grace and mercy. On the cross, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit allowed the cruelty and injustice and sin of the world to exhaust themselves within God's own person. And in this action, the persons of the Trinity were in total agreement. This was not an angry God expressing his rage on a docile Jesus Christ. No, this was a loving Father in anguish over the suffering of a loving Son, bearing it all in order to reconcile and redeem God's good world. And this action of God which we believe is unique throughout all time and space, was definitive and final. And that it brought the possibility of total healing to a sick and wounded world, a healing that will be complete when Christ returns and ushers in a new heaven and a new earth. The other actions of God against sin and injustice, like those recounted in Isaiah, we can think of as like a surgeon removing cancerous tum tumors. Necessary and good even, but only temporarily effective. The cross and the resurrection works to cure the disease right at its source. And so we have finally come to our third and our final cornerstone concept for this morning, which is that God, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, loves this world and the people in it enough to work for and to bring about total healing. Would you please pray with me? Dear Lord God, um, I'm thankful for this church community where we can consider even the more confusing and challenging portions of your word without fear of stepping on some invisible boundary or crossing some invisible line. This morning, we're thankful that you, God, are not indifferent to the suffering and justice that we see around us in this world. You work to right wrongs. You work to lift up the lowly and to free the oppressed. And God, we are thankful most of all for your incomprehensible love, willing to redeem this world by your own suffering on the cross. We left all of these things before you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we